Hey everyone, so before we begin, I just want to let you know that this episode of Big Talks contains content that may be sensitive or alarming to some viewers. If you'd like to avoid this content, go ahead and check out our video's description. Finally, if you're going through a hard time in your life right now, reach out to someone that you trust. Alright, so let's get right into it. Welcome back to Big Talks, because we hate small talk. We have Musa and Saudi here, and we're going into our fourth episode of Big Talks. Mm-hmm. All right, so what's our topic for today? <laughs> okay, so based on recent events, I've been contemplating something, and I'm going to go ahead and just throw it out at you guys. It is, is it ever okay to be racist? Right, and you know... We kind of wanted you guys to just kind of think about this, right? Take a pause and really think about your answer to this question. Is it ever okay to be racist? So this is actually a question that I tend to ask my students um, because I am in the field of education. And one of the first things that I always love to teach Whenever I start working with any student, whether it's in a traditional class, whether it's in tutoring or whatever, is about racism. This is a topic that I always strongly um, advocate for its education. So is it ever okay to be racist? And I would ask this question to students of all ages, um, all backgrounds, all ethnic backgrounds, um, different religions, doesn't matter, right? And... There's two things that typically happen. One is that they'll answer the question, or two is they'll ask me, what is racism? (laughs) Um, And I go ahead and I give them a pretty simplified definition of racism, which we'll talk about later. And we move on from that point. I don't tell them any historical aspects. I don't tell them anything like that. Just, is it ever okay? And the answers that I get are actually quite surprising. So sometimes I'll get answers such as, Typical answers, no, it's never okay to be racist. Why would you ever be racist, you terrible human being? Um, And then sometimes I'll get, I don't know much about it, so I don't know. And there are the few odd times that I'll get, well, yeah, because what if that other person is wrong? Um, And those, those responses always have stood out to me, always. Because it brings me to this very, very um, strong point of thought where I think to myself, well, what do you mean by it's okay to be racist because they might be wrong, right? And through a little bit of discussion here and there, I learned that sometimes students feel that um, they feel that in some type of disagreement, people have different ways of thinking about things, right? Um that it's okay to to be racist because that other person they might actually be right and that other person might be wrong so it's it's a little bit confusing to me because i'm like well racism is you know it has to do with ethnicity and skin color and right. such right physical features um what does that have to do with them being wrong and then it kind of boils down to well um well, they don't know. They don't, they don't know how to explain that association. Right. So then it, it, through discussion, it kind of boils down to just discrimination in general. Now, that is something different, right, to me. And then it kind of hits me. I start to make these associations in my head and start to ask questions, right? First of all, where do these kids even get these ideas from? Right. Where, do these, where do these ideas really stem from? Now, this brings me back to, and I'm sorry, this is probably really fast-paced, and I'm, I hope I'm not making crazy leaps that, I hope you guys can follow what I'm saying, but it brings me back to thinking about the dynamics of inside of a household, right? Inside of a household, you may find, uh, and, 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 and this is just a, a generalized example, this is not anything specific, right? But you might find that parents... Um, may act a certain way toward a specific race or someone from a specific ethnicity Mm. that they won't act towards someone else. However, I don't believe that children have it inherently in them 
to associate that with the person's race. They right. just see that that person was wrong about something because their parents were upset about it. Mm. So that association is just like built in their brain without any true understanding. Because when I try to question my students about it, or <laughs> I sound like I'm interrogating them, but if I try to like have them analyze it, when we break it down, so they'll, they'll answer, yeah, uh, I guess racism's okay because they were wrong. They answer that kind of automatically based on what they've seen. But then if I actually have them break it down to like what Musa will always say, first principles. Hey. Um, <laughs> if I have them break it down to that, they can't answer it anymore. They're like, wait, what? I've even had some students say when I, when I had them break it down and analyze it. At a certain point, they were like, wait a minute. That's got nothing to do with race. Right. They were just wrong. That's you actually know? really interesting. And yes, yeah, go first, ahead. <laughs> first principles. <laughs> no, mm. but that's 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 the interesting thing. You know, that's kind of what happens when you even use first principles. Is right. you have the general idea, and then that idea is made up of certain things. Right? There's certain things that built up that idea. So you try and get to the root. You try and use the first principles thinking, which is basically trying to break everything down to the simple ideas. Yeah. And then figure out what those simple ideas are and see if they've even been put together correctly. Mm-hmm. And I I had no idea where you were going with this. <laughs> I'm over here hearing this story, and I'm like... I've never told you this story. No, you've never told yeah. me this. And um, I'm over here hearing it, and I'm like, why would these kids think that? Mm-hmm. Like, that doesn't make any sense, because mm-hmm. if you think about racism, you're saying because they're wrong. Where did this connection come from? Right. And I think your your method of questioning them was really solid, because, I mean, right. at the end of the day, we need to teach them to think for themselves for one yes. but to even know why it is that they believe what they believe right you know kind of segueing back into the last episode why do you believe have this belief because that's a belief exactly so exactly i think that's really really interesting right and i mean if, if any to anyone that's listening and you've gotten up to this point i just want to give you our answer no um <laughs> in case you're worried where this where this episode's right. even going yeah um but I wanted to introduce it that way because it is something that is so important in this world. Mm. And it, it literally comes down to the fundamentals of who we are as human beings. Because there are some people that will, that will say, um, there is no race. We are a human race. And then there are other people that will say, Yes, race does exist, but it doesn't necessarily separate us, right. right? And I can see both sides, and I can understand both sides, and I'm not necessarily going to say what my side is, um, but what I will say is that I, I think whenever you're, whenever you're entering the dynamic of a classroom, you're creating this dynamic. And I always say this. I always believe that your classroom is like your little universe, and you... And this is not to be shirk in any way, by the way, if you're Muslim. <laughs> but you, you kind of, you, you. I don't know what word to use except create. I mean, can you think of a word? Um. Well, in terms of like the worldly bits of creation, obviously we're not creating it out of nothing. But right. you're creating this classroom, right? You're creating the environment and the dynamic that exists in this classroom. And discrimination, racism, prejudice, injustice, those kinds of things are things that I will never, ever, ever tolerate in my classroom. Right. I mean, just to comment on that, I think what you're looking for kind of, because I, I, I can't think of it. Cultivate? Another, maybe cultivate, but it's, I guess, the if you inject the Islamic understanding into it, right. you have to understand that you have a responsibility mm-hmm. in how you put it together. Mm-hmm. Right? So even though, yeah, in, in some sense you are creating something, you're not because, I mean, you're not really creating it from nothing. You're just like like putting the pieces together to manifest it in some way Mm -hmm. but you have a responsibility at the end of the day to do it the right way we definitely do and um the reason why i always start off on racism and I'm, i'm such a big propagator of knowing what it is understanding why it happens and also bringing kids bringing people into the mindset that it's never okay for this to happen no matter what right Um, it's just so important to me. And it's the reason why I started from the angle of, well, what do you think, right? Because, again, one of the reasons why racism happens, in my opinion, is because it was taught, right? right? So if I come in and I say, 
it's never okay to be racist. That's just going to be taught. Are they going to truly understand that it's not okay? So we've got one group that's being taught that it's okay, and one group that's being taught that it's not okay. And where do those two groups actually meet in reality, right? right. Well, you've got oppressors and you've got oppressed groups and both sides now are always in conflict with each other without anyone really understanding what's actually happening right i'll give you an example um for those of you who don't know or even for those of you who do know we've got our classic example of jane elliott right so jane elliott is a diversity advocate and she's been a teacher for like ever right she's 87 i think 87 right now and in 1968, she did the infamous blue eyes, brown eyes experiment, right? In her classroom, um, which, by the way, to some may seem unethical because nobody was prepped for this experiment. But what she did was she kind of called out the people. And by the way, Jane Elliott is a pure, supposedly white woman, okay? She called out children by the difference of their eye color. So she was like, look, I need blue eyes here, brown eyes here. And if you have blue eyes, and she just outright said it. She was like, if you have blue eyes, you're better than those that have brown eyes. And you're smarter and you've got more skills and whatever she did, right? And what ended up happening was that these kids now with the blue eyes, some of them may have felt bad, which is what I originally thought. But what ended up really happening was they started believing this about themselves and then they started fighting with the brown eye kids brown eye kids started fighting back some kids probably didn't fight back and just like that racism was created in this classroom wow. of a bunch of young uh impressionable minds who did not know what the reason was or why or what was even going on right and you know again this i i I really like this example or this talk that we're getting into just because how powerful of a message it is Mm -hmm. but just like how much it proves the last talk that we had about why it's important to know what you believe Mm -hmm. choose what you believe Mm -hmm. and actually understand the belief that you've even adopted. Right. Because here we have examples of kids They were who, third graders, yeah. Third graders who just haven't even gotten to that stage yet, right? Exactly. I mean, like, and when it comes to their ability to reason, they haven't developed their ability to reason yet. Yeah, Or fully. they're in the process of yeah. developing it. And here you go, you give them a belief. When they adopt it, that's it. Yep. <laughs> you yep. Know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. And, I mean, again, it just kind of boils down to... Um, It boils down to, well, I don't want to oversimplify it. (laughs) Um, But the reason why I brought up Jane Elliott is because when we transfer this idea of racism into why it happens, there are innumerate reasons why racism happens, right? Right. Now, part of the reason why we're even having this big talks, um, and we're actually having this big talks recording it earlier than we would normally record, just because of recent events and they kind of triggered all of these thoughts and all of these feelings inside of us especially me this is something that i'm just crazy passionate about um especially growing up as a brown person uh a muslim in america right Mm -hmm. i mean it's it's been rough for me and i'm not i'm not trying to say that it's been as rough for me as it's been for other people but it's definitely something that i understand right um and i've experienced myself to an extent but when when it comes down to like this concept of you know why why is this even happening and 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 musa you're absolutely absolutely right about it comes down to understanding and choosing your beliefs right um it's 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 something that's just like mind-boggling but at the same time it's not Mm. um because it just shows the weakness of people in general and it kind of shows again how we don't really choose what we believe we don't really understand what we believe and again belief is not just a religious thing i mean even just the fact that someone is racist right is a belief that they hold right um and Jane Elliott, she is just this amazing person who has been fighting this for 60 years or however long she's been fighting this. And I thought that that story was just so important to share with you guys, um, especially those of you who may not have ever heard that story before. Right. 
just because of how relevant it is with what's happening in our world today, right? Because where where did this shooter get the idea that, okay, I'm going to go ahead and shoot up Asian people, you know? Where, where did that shooter get in New Zealand when he decided to go shoot up Muslim people? Or why did Hitler do what he did? Or what, you know, it, it's... We tend to only talk about the effects of what's happening. Right, but we don't really get into the cause. We don't really get into the cause. I mean, and again, we leave that to the experts. That's what we say. Oh, we'll go on Google and it'll be like, scientists explain and psychologists explain. And I'm just thinking here, like, you know, regular people can explain this stuff too. And actually, we don't need a bunch of scientific studies. And I'm not saying that they're not helpful. They're definitely helpful. um, To really understand the dynamics of how these things happen i mean look at jane elliott she's a regular teacher in her classroom something that she was passionate about and she decided to go for it now nowadays she might have been uh terminated and arrested but she (laughs) but she she went for it you know she went for it because she was like look i see something happening in this world and i'm gonna prove to you something right and you know even just to go back on that comment about science and psychology yeah science and psychology have their limits right Mm -hmm. and morality is not a field it's not a topic that science science can handle you can't it's not easy to apply the scientific method to morality right and even within psychology psychology gets closer because it starts using different methods but still there's still a limit because even psychology in a sense has a heavy focus on the physical aspect of the mind Mm -hmm. and the effects that the physical has on the non-physical aspect. I mean, morality transcends the physical. Right, but where does morality come into this? Right. Right, how do you physically, how do you study morality from a physical aspect? Mm -hmm. It's it's not nearly as easy. And of course, they do make some connections. Mm -hmm. But I guess the reason why I'm bringing this up is because you're bringing up how regular people can do this. Yes. I feel like... You need a different method aside from science in order to even look into this. Of course, I agree. So, yeah, it, it, it's like strong justification of what you're saying. You, mm-hmm. The regular person can use the means given to them. Right. One being like self-inherent truths. Yeah. In order to even analyze this situation and really come to powerful conclusions about it. Exactly. I mean, another thing that I've done with my students is... and. Uh, and this might seem a little bit controversial, um, is I, so I had an, I had a plan to kind of execute my a version of the blue eyes brown eyes experiment, um, and I didn't go fully through with it um, just because of the ethical implications and because of the worry of what may happen. Right. Um, so I kind of took it from a different approach, and there's this one day where. I just kind of went up to to my students and again the reason why in case you're thinking I'm some wacko it it's not that the reason why the reason why I go as far as I do I mean yes commas periods and all that stuff is important sure but the reason why I go as far as I do is because character is the most important thing that you could ever develop. Uh, if you're a Muslim, you should know this, right? Islamically speaking, um, the first thing that we're going to be questioned about in the day of judgment is our character, right? So I understand that. That's important to me. That's something that I truly understand and value, right? So when I look in, if you know, if I'm in a teaching job, if I'm working, uh, at, you know, as, at a school, or if I'm even private tutoring, or if I'm in charge of some type of youth group, or whatever the different things that I've done, I always prioritize character, and I prioritize that culture that's that's cultivated inside of that group, right? Um, so I decided that I was going to go up, and now. We obviously don't show our faces on this podcast, but I am of Indian descent. Um, so I've got, you know, regular brown skin, whatever, right? So I went up and I had a class mixed of mixed of students. There's some brown, some black, some white, you know. Um, and I said, I need a helper. Um, and immediately, you know, everyone, uh, typically kids tend to have fun in my class. I hope so. Um, so everyone was excited because they want to help me. And they know, like, we're probably going to be doing some fun activity anyway. Right. Um, and so people are immediately raising their hands. They're trying to get up. And I was like, everyone sit down. Um, actually, I want a specific helper. 
and they were like okay yeah and I said look I want my helper to look like me um which immediately their faces <laughs> their faces just immediately started turning and they actually started looking at each other because they don't even know who looks like me they don't even pay attention to how they look right and I said look I want my I want my helper to look like me um so if you have a skin color that's similar to mine um raise your hand and uh and then one kid was like but why and i was like because i think you'll do a better job (laughs) um and they were like okay and then like people started like comparing their skin color and then they were like wait i don't even know what color i am what what color am i and they were like i'm do wait do i look like you like uh, and people started looking at their faces and like the window and i'm like (laughs) and i'm just kind of standing there waiting just to see what happens you know The interesting thing that stood out to me in my little mini experiment was they didn't even know. And uh, we're talking about fifth fifth graders, Um, even older than the kids in Jane Elliott's experiment. Um, And they didn't even know, you know, inherently they didn't even know. I mean, I literally had some kids try to, to say, and they were not the same skin color as me, that they were. Just because they wanted to be that person to help me. Just because they wanted to fit in with that role that they thought that they were supposed to fit in with. Right. And that's just kind of reminding me about the mix of cultures that happens. Like how, you know, there's there's certain cultures that have been developed in in America, especially within the 90s, right? Mm -hmm. Like you have the black culture that kind of got developed and rap and all this stuff kind of got associated with the black culture. Right. And then... It kind of led to different cults or different people wanting to be into that culture. Mm-hmm. So they were willing to adopt those things. Right. And then there's just this whole conflict between them. You know, like black people, white people, you know, they're over here trying to act the same way. And they, there's like this instant. What, what's the word I'm looking for? This instant um, negative outlook on the ones trying to join the culture Mm -hmm. but they're trying to join it because they enjoy the culture (laughs) you know not that they um not that they actually match what's there but like it's just reminding me about that like how these kids are like oh well they're adopting the they're adopting something that's not actually true Mm -hmm. just to fit in right and that kind of brings me you know brings me to the idea of conformity right. um, which is something that I strongly advocate for and I teach my students as well I always there's a couple of things that I always teach I always teach racism I always teach conformity injustice prejudice and um, just world issues in general right. um, even though I could be teaching any subject it doesn't even matter what subject I'm teaching I will continue inshallah to teach those things regardless of where I go um, Turn it into a math. <laughs> Teach them some algebra. Uh, yeah, I mean, I've done like math. I've done math, um, math tutoring, math programs, and stuff like that. Never been a math teacher, but it doesn't matter what subject it is. I will, I will. I think that this is just so important. Take this equation. The x variable is equal to white people. The uh, y variable is equal to black. Right? <laughs> exactly. Racism in exactly. Algebra. Yeah. Why not? You know? Why not? I mean, we we learn about the guy with the forty six bananas. Why can't we learn about? <laughs> why can't we learn about that? <laughs> um. But yeah, it, it, it there's it boils down to many different things. Um, conformity being one of them. Wanting to fit in with something else right Right. um and if you really think about just the depth of just how far uh racism goes um it's it's crazy i mean like i'm actually interested i know you wanted to mention something about racism and yeah but i want to hear the rest of the story first which story the story you were mentioning about your students i kind of interjected and kind of had my own ideas on it so i actually i actually want to finish that story oh um well basically they were just acting up and you know trying to find all different kinds of reasons and whatever and then i i had a a step further but i didn't want to go further than that so i decided to turn it into a question instead and i was like everyone settle down 
what if I told you, I'm not telling it to you, but let's say I took this a step further and I said, you know, what if I told you that those with the brown skin are actually better? It has nothing to do with how you do your job. I just think you're better. What if I told you that? And some kids actually started fighting me and, you know, one kid just shouted out from the back, you know, you'd be the worst person that I'd ever met. And um, he was like, but I don't think you are. I think you're just testing us. And everyone kind of looked at him and then they all looked back at me and then they were like, you are, aren't you? (laughs) And I was like, yeah, it was like a test all along. I just wanted to see how you guys would react and I want you to understand certain things. And, you know, we got into this discussion about racism and, you know, I had some kid get near tears. um, The same one that told me that I would have been the worst person that he ever met. And, you know, I went to talk to him individually and I was like, you know, I, I didn't mean to make you so emotional about this topic. I, and mind you, he's white, by the way, he's, he's white skinned. He's not white as in Caucasian, but he's white skinned. And, you know, I, I was like, I, I never meant to make you, you know, feel so emotional about this. And he was like, you know, I don't know. I just, I just know that it's wrong. Um, and it's just, I just feel it. And I was like, yeah, well, you know, you're right. And um, continue to use that that emotion and that strength that you feel inside of you when when you get older. Um, Because it's something that we're missing in this world. Right. And just the fact that he even, like, chose to, like, stand out and stand out, sorry, and and fight, fight it is just something so important to me because in our school system, our kids are indoctrinated. And I know that that's an opinionated statement. That's a subjective statement. Um, And people will disagree with me. And I don't care. um, Because (laughs) because to me, it's near absolute truth. I'm not going to say that it is. And I'm not going to say that it happens in every school with every teacher. And it definitely does not happen with me. But that's there's um, there's a high justification for that claim, right? I mean, there's a systemization that has occurred, and you know, just from a, just from so far, we've kind of been talking about things from a psychological aspect. But if we kind of throw it into the sociological aspect and and how it how it implements or not implements, but how it uh, or is implemented like worldwide, right? It's the school system, right? You know, and. I feel like that's a really good point because yeah. systematic, like even if you look at racism, like there's there's the the concept of systematic racism, uh huh, and or systemic there, I think? systemic racism, yeah. yeah. But it's there's a lot of justification for this, right? Like of even course. even if you look at the way that they structure the schools, the way that they describe. In, or the way that they control history. Mm-hmm. Let's say it that way, right? Because mm-hmm. the way that they control history is one such way in which there's there's a lot of systemic... Right. So it's, it's a systematic thing. Right. This isn't necessarily an individual thing. And, you know, that system is what is being implemented at the lowest levels of these kids. You know, yes. these kids are very young. They're walking into the system because we're forced to send them to these schools. If you can't afford to, to, to deal with your, your child's education on your own, you have to send them to school or else you're going to go to jail. So yeah. you have to put them into the system. And then the way that the system in itself is, is taught, like you look at social studies, you look at science, you look at all these different, well, maybe not science, but you look at social studies, right? Yeah. Social studies class is what? It's based, the information that they receive is based on the idea or whatever the country that you're in wants to teach about it right right and i mean we're talking about how many different races how many different ethnicities how many different cities and states that exist in the entire world Mm -hmm. but for some reason only four or five of their histories are really taught Mm -hmm. i mean you get into world history a bit you learn like a very small section of like greek history african history but let's be real how many african people know their history Mm mm-hmm you know, not a lot of African people know their history. What is the history of Africa? Right. You ask them that question, they don't have a clue. Mm-hmm. Even though that's where their bloodline, that's where their ethnicity roots from. But they don't know that history. Why? Because the European history books is what's being taught. It's being taught in Africa. It's being taught in America. It's being taught in Europe. It's being taught even in Asia. You look at the Asian kids, they have a little bit of their own history. They get taught their own history, right? Right. But a lot of it has to do with the American history. It has to do with the European history. It has to do with 
their perspective of what everything was going on. Mm-hmm. And that is a systemic thing. His story. Right. And this isn't only this this is one application of it, but when it comes to things like racism, there's there's a whole bunch of other things. Like earlier you were mentioning something about maps. Right. I mean, um it's something that Jane Elliott again and I recommend that everyone just kinda look into this woman. Um she's just Alhamdulillah, she's a really good advocate. Um, Maps, right? Uh, Back in the day when cartographers were kind of exploring the world and looking into how maps should be made, um, and we already already know that white supremacy exists, okay? Now, um, my best friend or one of my best friends is white, so obviously I'm not trying to say that this is all white people and yada, 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 all that stuff, okay? But it does exist right and first and foremost we need to be honest with ourselves that these things do exist Um, otherwise we can't change it otherwise we can't change it we can't move forward things will continue on the same road if you know we just act like this stuff doesn't exist oh racism doesn't exist come on these are just individual people right and you know i think that idea that racism doesn't exist is because people connect the context of racism that people use these days has to do with the slave trade. The slave trade, right. So black slave trade, this is the context that they take their understanding of racism from. Mm-hmm. And does that scenario still exist? No, it doesn't. But that's not what racism is. That's just one instance of racism that occurred. And it might. we can argue that maybe it's the worst, worst of them all, right? If you look through all of history, you have a lot. I mean, even if you look at the Holocaust, the Holocaust was a pretty big scenario. Mm-hmm. But that's typically what people, at least in America, associate it with. Mm -hmm. And then when they see that that's not occurring anymore, it starts trickling down the idea that racism doesn't exist. Right. But that's not true. The thing is, racism is not... It's it's, it's not a... It's it's roots are not in a sociological... uh, Occurrence. Occurrence. Its roots are in a psychological occurrence. Right. Right. It stems from individuals who have problems, who decide that they're going to use race. Right. And, you know, this, this, again, if we go back to systematic racism, right, the question that you asked earlier, well, why is the system, why? why? Ask why. Because someone created it. Right. It came back to somebody held a certain belief. They acted on that belief. And they built a system this and way. And that belief expanded because people can form. Right. And now that we have a bunch of people who want to pretend like it doesn't exist, mm-hmm. the system continues to thrive. Right. Now the system is allowed to stand just simply because nobody wants to stand against it. Exactly. And I mean, the influence is so great because let's, like, let's take it back to maps, right? Cartographers, when they were exploring the earth, getting the, you know, how big, how big are certain places, how big are certain continents and stuff like that. We know that the earth is a sphere unless you're a flat earth follower um typically if you believe that the earth is a sphere right there's no way for us to necessarily accurately depict this earth on a flat 2d image because it's 3d right but let's say we at least try it is a fact that the maps that we see in our textbooks from literally like pre-k okay i don't know if there's maps in pre-k textbooks i've never really done pre-k but let's say that from 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 as young as maps start being introduced right maybe second first okay. or second when we social don't studies see in. we don't really see the accuracy of the world right and and jane elliott was a huge propagator of this because she brought it to the world's attention and probably other people as well but i know about her that the typical map that we look at does not depict the actual size of the African continent, right? Um, And yes, Africa is a continent. It's not a country, people. Please, (laughs) please, please, please. Um, I've had so many people tell me that Africa is a country. It's not a country. There are so many. But you see, the reason why I brought that up is to just elaborate just how small just how small this system has made us believe that Africa is. Right. Right? Oh, what country, you know, what name a certain country? Africa? Please. Africa is not a country. Africa is a continent. It is huge. It's massive. It's literally at least twice its size on the actual earth. 
than what we see on a map. Right. And just this this mindset of that Africa is like this one country that is so damaging to the minds of our children right. because it it takes away from the fact of just how huge how impactful this continent has been throughout history right I right mean, like even if you look at the beginning of human history as we know it right yes. i mean as muslims we know that it kind of went further than that but as far as recorded history went the earliest recorded history where did humanity start it started in africa yep <laughs> then they kind of moved outwards and of, of course there's multiple origin points people will say you have one that started in africa one that started in china one that started in south america we mm-hmm. have evidence for a few of these different things however the most impactful and the, the most justified opinion is that it started in africa and you know you're right you look at the map africa looks like it's the same size as south, south america, america. But yeah. in actuality, it's like twice the size of South At America. Least. And this is an example of system, a systematic problem, right. right? The system of what we're taught, what, what kids are taught, is that this is what it looks like. Mm-hmm. When it's actually twice the size. And you're right, it leads to opinions like, oh, well, Africa is just a country. Exactly. When actually it's a continent. And I think the most interesting thing is why did they make it that size on the map? Even more interesting, let me ask you this. Why is North North? Is Africa in the Northern Hemisphere? Is it? Why can't we flip the Earth? If space is expanding in every direction. Right. At an infinite, supposed infinite, you know, speed or whatever. Not infinite speed. Accelerating speed. Accelerating, right, okay. (laughs) <laughs> um, and it can go in all directions then why is north north and why is south south we just pinned it that way exactly That's the label why can't we it. turn why can't we flip the earth over then why can't Africa be on top why can't it be three times the size of Europe right and I think that's the point, right? Exactly. That was the point that I wanted to lead to. It's actually three times the size of Europe yeah. and you know you're you're mentioning this earlier about how you know it's not like the cartographers didn't know this mm-hmm. the cartographers these european people going around and checking the sizes and and the dimensions of everything mm-hmm. when they decided to transfer that information into a map form right they chose to make africa of a smaller size yes. they chose to depict it smaller because yes. they don't want people to really see that africa by size is three times the size of their home country we don't see the strengths of these nations right for example you go on facebook you go on social media tiktok whatever you guys are using these days i sound old um and what do we see we see these hungry african kids um you know we're at, they're asking for donations i am not saying that those things do not exist of course those things exist but we don't necessarily see the strengths of these countries and these nations and just the amazing things that were put in throughout history. And I mean, this brings me back to like how Musa and I are always talking about African history together. And I think it's something that I would love to go into more. Right. Um, just because we don't know these things. We're not taught these things. We in, in school, we're taught about how the Europeans have dominated and our maps literally our visual representations of the reality of this world have been catered to what they want us to believe right and like that's just how deep this indoctrination goes right, right. and 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 we're surprised when people shoot people up we're surprised when these things happen and maybe we're not surprised anymore cuz it's gotten so frequent recently but Again, we look at the effects. Right. And, you know, I want to pose another question. Okay. And we, won't, we don't have to get into the definition or the actual explanation. But, um... Uh-huh. Even better question. Think about that scenario you just posed, right? Yeah. Where they're depicting the African kids who don't have... They, they, don't, they seem like they have no resources. Right. How'd they get to that point? Uh-huh. How did they get to that point? Because let's all the resources that mo- let me say all most of the resources that we have currently originate from Africa. Right. So if they originate from Africa, 
why is Africa depicted as the poor country? Mm-hmm. Now, you can look at this from a, from a uh, let's say, a subjective point, right? Mm-hmm. Well, it's that way because they just don't have resources or whatever. They did something to themselves, whatever answer you want to put. But in actuality, what happened? Right. That's the question. What happened? If all of the resources are coming from Africa, how is Africa not the richest country? Right. And, you know, even in history, <laughs> like in, in, in history, we know of a Muslim who was considered one of the richest people in the world. His name was Musa. <laughs> mm-hmm. And he <laughs> was an African ruler yeah. who was so rich that when he decided to go to Hajj, he traveled by foot, or not by foot, but you know, by, by not by car or anything like that. He traveled from right. Africa to Hajj. And on the way there, he gave money to everybody that he could find to a point where it actually broke the economy of all the different countries that he walked through. Wow. He gave out that much money. And that's just the, that's from the resources of Africa. Exactly. And then when he came back, I mean, he continued, but you know, it, it, it caused a huge problem. Right. <laughs> but still, like, just, just the richness of Africa, but we consider it a poor country. Right. The size of Africa, but we consider it small. Yeah. You know, it's, it's a lot of these things. And this is what we mean by systematic, right? This is a systematic issue. It is a systematic issue that's created from individual issues. Right. And, um, you know, it kind of, one topic that, I, or one idea that I wanted to pose was on, um, do we have an inherent bias toward racism? Now, I don't know. I mean, you guys can probably think about that question a little bit. I personally, so from from studying psychology, right, we do have certain concepts that make us more comfortable with what we're familiar with, like in-group bias, right? So in-group bias is a bias, of course, um, toward those who look like you. And what does that bias really entail? That bias entails feeling maybe more comfortable with those, maybe being able to find more structural differences in the faces of those people that look like you. Um, you know, we've we've heard comments like, oh, all Asians look the same, or like Koreans look just like Chinese, or, you know, whatever. There's certain unfamiliarities that we have with these races, or certain people, not me specifically, um, because I'm technically asian um but not the asian that you think of when you see asian right Right. um but i i can see you know those structural differences um but some people you might you hear comments like that or all black people look the same or all you know indian people look the same and of course we've got similarities in our features right but no one truly looks exactly the same unless they're like identical twins and even then there's still some slight differences right and again like if you look back at your experiment with the kids right they didn't even know they didn't even know they didn't they didn't even know exactly and you know we so in group bias does exist in group bias does not necessitate the belief that you're superior than one or another right and you know that leads into the definition of racism you know racism by definition if we look at the oxford dictionary it's the belief that different races possess distinct characteristic abilities or qualities especially so as to distinguish them as inferior or superior to one another right you had that waiting there yeah i kind of had that one waiting (laughs) okay and um you know there's truth there's some truth in the first half of it. In the first half of it, we're talking about the different characteristics of the races, right? Mm-hmm. There's truth in that. Obviously, not all races are the same. Right. There's different biological makes up, different physical makeups. But that does not necessitate superiority or inferiority. Right. That's something that we add on to it. And if we go into the first principles definition or try start going into first principles to understand what's wrong with this, if we separate the right and the wrong from it, the right is the differences. Right. The wrong is the adoption of a belief that that makes you superior or inferior. Exactly. So where does that come from? Right. If mm-hmm. we dive into the first principles of that, it dives back into discrimination. Mm-hmm. And I think this is... We can probably dive even deeper into it, but discrimination is the root of racism because there's different forms of discrimination, racism being one of them. Right. And that's really what the problem is. Like even if you look at racism, right? These days, people try and target racism. They talk about racism. They talk about these. And they focus on 
the differences of the, the skin color, right? Like, there's no differences. They focus on this element. They focus on the differences of the races. But that's not the problem. The problem isn't that there's different races. You want to focus on the discrimination. Right. I mean, they focus on, again, what we see with the effects. They focus on right. what's manifested. But if you want to get to the... If you want to solve a problem in medicine... You have to get to the root. I mean, that's this, how you solve a problem in any field. Right. And the root of racism is not... It, it doesn't just stop at racism. It goes deeper into discrimination. Right. So discrimination is the topic that you need to deal with. And exactly. it's not only in racism. Because race discrimination from a different thing will just come back and fuel the fire for racism all over again if you yeah. don't deal with discrimination in general. Right? And this kind of leads me to thinking about the the Hadith you know, during the farewell sermon of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, he mentions, and, you know, a lot of people, some people like to mention that, you know, oh, the Prophet, he was an advocate against racism since all the way back, which is true. Yeah. He was. Even before Martin Luther King and all these different things that happened, the idea of stopping racism already existed. Right, of course. And basically what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said was, the Arab is not better than the non-Arab and the black is not better than the white. Mm -hmm. those qualities don't make them better than each other. The only thing that does make you better is your piety. Right. And in Islam, piety is not something you can judge for yourself. Right. You can't just consider yourself, oh, I'm more pious than this person because <laughs> only Allah can judge that. I mean, if you say that, you're probably not. Right. Just by calling yourself more pious, you've now entered the realm of arrogance. Yeah. <laughs> right. So that by, by default, like it just completely contradicts that. The best you can do is ask somebody if you're pious mm -hmm. to have an idea of how you're doing because obviously the goal is piety and we need to have some gauge of whether we're pious or not right. but we can't just determine that we're pi that we're we're pious people this that's something we can do right so there's no route basically that one sentence eliminated race eliminates racism mm -hmm. because on the physical aspects of things you can't use that as a way to judge mm -hmm. the only thing that you can use to judge is piety and you can't even judge it yourself right so what do you have nothing there's no difference between any human being right you can't there is a difference, but you cannot determine that difference. Therefore, there's no reason to adopt a belief right. that you're better than someone right. else. You know, I think a lot of you listening um, would think that you know we've we've made so many subjective statements, and uh, on the surface level, they may seem that way. But what I want to do is I want to challenge you guys to really analyze your own beliefs. And again, it just so everything just always ties back into this. Um, it needs to be understood why we hold the beliefs that we do it just it needs to be understood and this needs to be something that is taught from very very young on i right. mean we don't have kids currently um but just from working with children for so long I mean, this is an advice that I have. And again, I, I know people may not want to take advice from someone who doesn't have their own children, but this is like a plea to everyone that has children. Please teach your child to understand, and you yourself and all of us, to understand why beliefs become beliefs, why they're held, you know, why does racism happen right because until we really start acknowledging the roots of things they're not going to change mm. there's no difference that's going to be made um things will continue to roll the way that they do people will continue to stay silent and like i refuse to stay silent i will inshallah never stay silent unless the voice is literally taken out of me by God himself, okay? Um, and hopefully, inshallah, that never happens. So right. um, that's well, not good, a duet. <laughs> well, the good thing is there's an action higher than voice, and that's, right. act, you know, physical yes. action. You know, Islam teaches that if there's an evil that's occurring, stop it with your hands. Mm -hmm. If you cannot stop it with your hands, speak out against it. Right. If you cannot speak out against it, at the bare minimum, you should hate it in your heart. Right. And 
you know, this goes both ways, right? Mm-hmm. If you don't hate it in your heart, you're not likely to speak out against right. it. And if you don't hate it in your heart or speak out against it, you're not likely to do something about it physically. Yeah. So it's a good framework for understanding yourself in these situations. Because if you see racism and you're not willing to stop it, right. but and you're not willing to speak out against it, then you need to question whether you actually hate it in your heart. You do need to question whether you hate it in your heart. And you need to question, again why does it happen right right? and obviously we know that it's never okay but it's not just as simple as saying well it's never okay don't be racist it needs to be truly understood why these things happen and you know in this talk we've gone over some sociological aspects we've gone over some psychological aspects we've gone over some religious aspects all of these things need to be combined together holistically to truly truly try to understand stay objective and act on it act against it Right. And the last thing that I want to say on this, back to that comment I was making, if you've come to the point where you see something happening and you don't have the will to stop it with your hands, you don't have the will to speak against it, and you've analyzed it to find out that you hate it in your heart, you will find the confidence to take the next step. Yeah. Where once you've defined, I believe that I hate this, and that becomes who you are you're going to take the next step and speak out against it. Right. And once you've taken that next step to speak out against it, if it still doesn't stop, but you've established the first two, you're going to physically stop it. Right. Yeah. All right, everyone. So we hope you enjoyed this podcast. Um, It was a pretty heavy topic. Uh, We tried to go at it from different angles and teach you guys something that maybe you guys have not heard before. Um, or maybe give you a certain angle to think about things right. um, or even help you kind of take some insight and some more control um, or not control necessarily, but more influence in um, in the minds that are being created within your own households, right? right. The, i.e. your kids um, or even, even your parents, even you, whatever, right? Um, it's just so important and we hope that you know we hope that you gained something from this um so anyway guys i hope that you <laughs> i hope that you enjoyed it i hope you learned something um to my muslims out there assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh and to and everyone else thank you for tuning in to big talks because we hate small talk <laughs> thanks <laughs> <laughs>